Well, thank you for the introduction, and it's great to be here, and I'm delighted to be a part of Midas and have the chance to uh, work on one of the first um, group of projects. Um, and in particular, the project that we've embarked on um, earlier this year is in uh, learning analytics. And it will become clear throughout my presentation why is it um, that we look at learning analytics uh, from a personal angle. And I would like to start by sharing with you an email that I received um, about a year ago, and several others from University of Michigan have received this as well. And what this is um, saying, it's appealing to fellow faculty members um, in asking us to join um, a meeting on October 26, 2015, uh, for a discussion on two important resolutions. One of them had to do with the public release of um, course evaluations, and that's still in discussion. But another one, which eventually did reach a resolution, um, had to do with an initiative on reducing heavy student drinking. Um, and eventually, after that meeting, the resolution was that there will be um, classes set on Friday mornings um, in order to reduce uh, heavy drinking on Thursday night. Since then, I learned that there is actually a name for that heavy drinking on Thursday night. Uh, one of my students shared with me the name of Thursday Thursdays. Um, so it is a popular um, day among students. Um, and eventually, when I get these kind of emails, I read them, and then I will move on to my next email. But this is one of the emails where I actually sat um, and thought about it. And I was wondering what was eventually the reason for coming up with this idea of um, having a class on Friday morning in order to reduce drinking on Friday night, on Thursday night. Um, and if you think about it, there are probably many other phenomena or, or events that will have implications on, on student learning, which are not always of an academic nature. Drinking on Thursday night is not something that we eventually take into account when we do learning analytics. So one question is, um, how could educators, or for that matter, higher administration, systematically identify such issues that could be addressed through interventions. Now let me jump to another uh, piece of information, which will, uh, is also playing a role in, in our project. Um, here is a chart that was produced by the National Science Foundation fairly recently, looking at gender distribution in uh, four different areas. So it's really percentage of women in a medical school, um, in physical sciences, in law school, and the red line would be computer science, which is the field where I belong. And as you can see, we did have a, a low number of women in all these fields in several years ago. Uh, but eventually, the only one field where there was a significant drop and um, it's not looking like it's getting better, is computer science. Uh, we did have a peak in the 80s where we reached 30 something percent. Those were the golden years for women in, in computing. Uh, but right now, what we have even here at Michigan, it's below 20 percent. So one question there would then be, um, what are the reasons behind declining number of women in computer science? There are several sort of intervention going on around the United States and also worldwide. Uh, but there is also the question of why is this happening? So one question that one might want to answer is what is the portrait of a successful woman in computer science? Or conversely, what are the traits of somebody who is likely to drop out? And here is one more example that I want to share, which is again part of the motivation of, of our project. Um, here are some tweets. Um, I'll just read a couple of them. I want someone to hold me and be um, there for me when I'm sad. Um, having a job again makes me happy. Less time to be depressed and eat all day while watching sad movies. So these are all signs of somebody who's not necessarily extremely happy. Um, and there are uh, signs, potential signs, of uh, <coughs> somebody who's going to experience or is experiencing depression. And there are some alarming statistics. Um, from the American College Health Association um, saying that at any given time there are about 10 to 15 percent 
of the students as experiencing depression. An even more alarming statistic from uh, UC Berkeley in 2015, throughout their graduate studies, 47% of the graduate student have experienced at least one um, depression, um, which is terrible if you think about it. So it's almost half of the students in the graduate program at Berkeley at some point uh, would experience depression. So here is another question that would be great if we could um, explore and find an answer. Um, what are the signs of depression among students and can we detect depression at its, um, at its outset? So looking at these three pieces of information and, and the questions that they will um, make us wonder about, uh, we sat down with um, several of, of my colleagues and this is my power slide. Uh, this is the, the team. Um, we have nine different people from seven disciplines. Um, Emily Maurer Provost, she is an assistant professor in computer science. She works on understanding emotions as expressed in speech. Um, she works on a number of exciting projects connecting computer science with other disciplines such as um, Shasage Health. Uh, Daniel Eisenberg is in the School of Public Health and he is in charge with the um, mental health projects across U.S. He's collecting information from campuses um, in the United States. Uh, Perry Sampson, I saw Perry is right here. Um, he has a lot of very interesting projects in um, the space of learning analytics. And in particular, he's the initiator of ECHO360, uh, which is currently used on campus in a, a large number of classes. And that's something that we also hope to tap into. Uh, where students can interact with the instructor during class. Um, and it's also a great source for learning about student behaviors um, in uh, courses they are taking. Uh, Stuart Karabenik, um, he is in the School of Education and he um, has experience with st student engagement um, and other critical aspects of learning. Um, Kevin Collins Thompson in the School of Information and are working on several educational projects. He's also working on natural language processing, like myself, um, and um, has a couple of studies going on in K-12 education. Uh, then we have the statistician wizard, Kirby Sheridan from the CISCAR. Um, him and his team are assisting us with um, various aspects that have to do with statistical analysis and correlations. Um, Satinder Baveja, machine learning and working on reinforcement learning. Um, and finally, Tim McKay, uh, who is the initiator of a number of efforts on campus in, in learning analytics. So what is that we are trying to do different? Um, typically, and without any intention to simplify things, but most or a large number of the projects in, in learning analytics will primarily focus on what we know about students' academics. So we'll look at grades, we'll look at the courses they take, we'll look at a major, eventually changes in major, like students, for instance, shifting from one discipline to another and so forth. Now what we are saying is that aside from this, there is another part that is very important uh, when we consider students, which is their more personal um, nature. Students have different personalities. They are introverts and extroverts. They are um, people that have different natures, they are more approachable or less approachable. Um, they have different values. They are people who value family and friends. They are people who, some people who value um, religion. They are people who value achievement and so forth. Um, they have different behaviors uh, throughout the day. They have different interests, um, experience different moods. Um, in general, they may be more optimistic in nature or even during a certain day, they may have a high or a low peak in terms of um, emotions they experience. So what we want to do in this project is to um, connect students' personal attributes to their academic performance. And the overarching goal is, well, there are two, two main goals. One is to gain new insights. Things along the lines of what I shared with you earlier, the email that found that students who drink heavily on Thursday night would have lower performance on Friday classes. Um, and so that is the kind of insight that we could learn from this kind of exploration where we have information on student behaviors and their academic performance. So we could learn, for instance, of what are the 
traits of somebody who's successful in computer science, again in line with my earlier example. Uh, we could also find the patterns of behaviors of students in physics or typical profile of somebody who is experiencing academic difficulty. And then on the other side, so those would be more correlations that we can identify in this data. The other would be um, predictions. Um, can we use these academic and personal attributes to predict academic success, um, GPA for instance, or generally being successful in a certain discipline? And also another interest is uh, predicting mental health. Can we detect the outset of, um, of depression? Now the way we, I would say we are planning to approach this. We have started, but it's uh, still in early stage, the project is in the early stages, is to integrate a number of different data streams. Um, they are the data streams that are often used in learning analytics, which have to do with academic performance. Uh, we are fortunate here at Michigan to have a lot of data collected already in um, data warehouse. So we'll have information about the degrees that the student is pursuing, their grades, uh, schedules, choices, credits, enrollment status, and, and so forth. The thing that we can get from here is the GPA, average number of credit hours um, they take in a semester, uh, major manners, um, even switches throughout their um, degree at Michigan, whether they say started with um, computer science and decided to move to linguistics or conversely, uh, moving from linguistics into science or physics. Uh, another stream of data that we uh, want to integrate is academic writings. Uh, students do write at various points um, in their college. It's quite a, a lot of writing. Um, there are the admission essays, uh, which are at the beginning um, of their stay at Michigan, and I'm pretty sure in other uh, universities as well. Uh, but there are a lot of writing assignments, um, exams. There are forums such as Piazza where they ask questions about homeworks they have to do or um, things that are not um, clear from the lecture and so forth. So from here what we can get, we can get the topics of interest, um, we can measure correctness of essays, um, we can um, find what are the kind of dialogue acts or interactions that they seek. Are they mostly asking for clarifications? Are they mostly caring about logistics? Um, are they in fact providing answers on a forum like Piazza where students themselves can help their peers? Yet another stream um, which will leverage uh, collaboration with ECHO360 is um, this um, student behavior in class. And this uh, platform has been used uh, by 60 courses uh, with uh, almost 7,000 students. And from here we can get for once in class attendance, uh, but also the number of notes taken, uh, what kind of notes students are taking in class, um, questions they are asking, um, what is the percentage of questions that were um, answered correctly? Um, how far are the notes from some kind of um, centroid over the notes, which will be the central team for the class and, and so forth. Um, and here is an interesting use of Echo360 um, uh, due to, to Perry Sampson. Um, Echo360 also has the um, uh, ability to ask surveys. Um, and so with this platform, uh, Perry ran a study where um, he looked at the emotional state before an exam and grade on exam uh, and found some um, interesting correlations, which uh, supports our hypothesis that looking at more personal um, aspects of students could in fact inform us about their academic performance, such as for instance, um, the um, emotional state. Yet another data stream, um, daily behaviors, sentiment, and emotions, um, which uh, we hope to get via natural language processing of social media streams. Um, and here what we can um, extract will be events that are attending, participation in internships, um, support of various organizations, sentiment that people have towards certain entities or, um, or events, and, and so forth. Personality and core values, uh, primarily from surveys and then um, also tools that we um, have started to work on that will allow us to infer um, values from own personality dimensions from natural language text. And here what we hope to get is personal interest, hobbies, um, um, 
moral values or otherwise general um, core values and um, personality dimensions. Mental health is something else that we care about. Um, and one of the faculty on our project, Daniel Eisenberg, is an expert in, um, in, in this area. He's been running mental health surveys across um, the country. And uh, we want to also collect such data here at Michigan and couple that with the other information that we have about the, the students. For a small number of students, um, we also plan to collect additional information that can be gathered via a smartphone app. Um, we are planning on doing this, um, building this ourselves, um, and we still plan to make changes to um, what we fortunately found, a student life app uh, that exists, um, that was created at Dartmouth. So we will have this mobile app that will, we will adapt to our own use and find additional information, such as, for instance, the number of conversations that the student has, the mood expressed in those conversations, um, daily level of stress, and, and so forth. Now, um, for that, uh, we we'll, are developing a number of, of methodologies. Um, this is another data stream that we plan to tap into, which is the location of students. And there are a number of other data streams that we are planning for. Um, different um, approaches from natural language processing, survey analysis, statistics. Um, speaking primarily for computational linguistics, which is my area, some of the things that we have been working on and plan to continue to work on is sentiment and emotion detection, um, extraction of entities and events, um, inference of values, behaviors, and interests. Um, style and readability, which is uh, critical for understanding of uh, communication that students have and, and so on. And of course, uh, coming with that, there are big data challenges. Um, um, we'll have a lot of data, even if we limit the study to a number of students. And one point that I want to make that this will be um, all based on opt-in. Um, so students will have to agree to participate in our study and um, We'll have this, uh, we are in the process of, of um, obtaining an IRB for, for, this, for this work. Now, to the extent that I have more time, I can um, quickly show you some of the things that we are doing in, um, in my group, the Language and Information Technologies in the Computer Science Department. Um, there are um, eight PhD students and um, three postdoctoral fellows. Things that are relevant to this um, area of work, we have um, targeted sentiment analysis, which extracts sentiment that students have toward courses and instructors. Uh, we are using a um, conditional random field in the first stage to find the entities of interest, and then we have a sentiment analysis uh, layered on top of that. This is work uh, primarily by my PhD student, Charles Welch. Um, another project that we've been actively working on, and um, I believe you had a chance to see one of the posters on uh, inferring values from text and making cross-cultural comparisons of values. Um, this is work by my uh, PhD student, Stephen Wilson. We are looking at using data that we collected initially by our surveys. We can infer values from text. And um, I will skip over the methodology. It's basically a topic uh, model method that allows us to infer topics. And fortunately, the slide is messed up, so I'll, I'll truly skip on that. Um, there are a number of teams that we found from the data that we collected from United States and India contributors. And uh, we also layered on top of that a regression model so that we could identify the role played by different demographics in these topic models. Culture was one, which is what we wanted to find. But in addition to that, of course, you'll have gender differences or age differences. Um, and so um, using that model, we were able to identify how these three dimensions, country, gender, and age, would play a role um, in the um, value teams that, that, we, uh, that we identified. And you will see different value teams here that um, have, are perceived, play a different role in, say, United States and, and India. Um, and 
public congratulations to my student for getting the most likely societal um, impact award yesterday. And finally, one other study that we've done recently is trying to understand what the students appreciate in a professor. This was based on um, Rate My Professor data. Uh, we collected uh, close to one million evaluations from 70,000 professors covering different disciplines, um, United States and Canada, and also low rank and top rank schools. Uh, one thing that one could easily run on top of this kind of data is to do prediction of sentiment, and we've done that, which was a confirmation that we can, in fact, use the text to predict the, um, the rating that students assign to the professors. But the more interesting part that we wanted to um, learn from this data is what do students actually care about. So we did topic modeling to identify Major, several major topics in the comments made by, by students. Um, and layer on that, we um, also use the regression model that allow us to see how the different dimensions play a role. Again, dimensions being discipline, um, country, and rank. And I'll skip over this again. Um, and what we were able to find is how um, different topics the student would comment about would eventually um, have a different impact in whether it's a, um, in different countries, different disciplines, and um, schools of different rank. And this will be a little bit more clear. So I chose two, um, to look at two aspects at the time. So here is, if we look at country, uh, we see how in Canada, approachability matters more than in US. So students in classes taught by professors in Canada would much more often comment on the professor's approachability than they would do um, in the United States. Um, instead, United States students will more often comment on, for instance, readings or clarity of their professors. Here is another comparison. This would be top ranked. Um, and low-ranked um, institutions. We see that in top-ranked schools, a student will focus more on readings and discussions um, and also clarity. In lower-ranked schools, they will be more concerned with helpfulness and expectations. And finally, here is another, just speaking two of the several disciplines that we looked at. Um, so this is uh, students in philosophy versus students in physics. Um, we see that in physics, students really care about clarity. And in a way, it's intuitive. It's a um, science area. Um, whereas in philosophy, they really care about the reading materials um, and also care a little bit more about approachability. So this is just to give you an idea of the kind of exploration that we can do with um, this kind of data that looks at more personal nature of students. And of course, we hope for much more um, while connected the personal information, personal attributes of students with um, their academic information. So I'll leave it here, and I look forward to getting questions during the, the panel. Well, thank you. About all the students. So we don't have an issue of sample or selection or recruitment. We have existing, what did I tell you guys, millions of rolls of event data from tens of thousands of